Coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's that time again, time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacey Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, my buddy Dean Martin always said, we've got a really great show lined up for you, and we hope this is it. I think it is today. <laughs> Dean Martin was... You know, I I don't know if we're a Martin and Lewis quite, but no. uh, we can aspire to be, perhaps. Am I Jerry? <laughs> yeah, that's the question. Which one is which? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> let's just get into it here. We're going to climb the walls today. We're going to go vertical, talking about uh, vines. And, Stacy, when we talk about vines, we're going to talk about tendrils, twiners, ramblers, and clingers. Sounds like rock bands from the 60s and 70s. Just put the in front of each one and yeah. you've got a whole lineup. The clingers, they were great. <laughs> one hit wonders. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in vines and climbing plants to grow on walls, trellises, fences. And uh, I guess we'll get started with the, the tendrils because they fascinate me how you can how you can take like your hand or a finger and, and touch a tendril and how it will react and, and move. Yeah, touch. they have to react very quickly because, of course, how are they otherwise going to be able to anchor themselves in wind or, you know, movement from animals and so forth passing by? So they, uh, they're they able to respond to that very quickly. As soon yeah. as they can grab onto something, they do. So the tendrils, let me run this by you, clematis, grapes, cucurbits, passion vine, and peas. Are those good examples of tendril plants? Yeah, so a tendril is basically going to be coming out of the leaf axle where the leaf meets the stem, and it's going to be a little uh, organ that just grabs on and winds itself around everything that it can. Now, I would say clematis are kind of sort of an exception to that, but I'm not going to go too far into it because I know we're going to talk all about clematis because there's so much to say about clematis, but clematis do a really weird thing. They wrap their leaf petiole, so they don't have a separate little tendril that comes out like a pea plant, yeah. which I'm sure a lot of people have seen. Yeah. They actually, the, the leaf uh, petiole, the stem that attaches it to the, to the main stem, actually wraps itself around its support. It's one of the wildest things you can ever see. But, you know, the important thing to remember about tendrils is anything that you're using to support a, a tendril plant is going to need to have lots of surface area for them to grab on. This is not something you're really going to be able to right. to grow up like a stockade fence or something like right. that. Exactly. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the fact that I say clematis and you say clematis. It's, you know, it's tomato, tomato, as we've often said <laughs> on the show before. Both are correct. You got it. Now we've got the twiners. Not the whiners, but the twiners. So we look at plants like mandevilla, honeysuckle, wisteria. Uh, one of my favorites, thunbergia, which is the black-eyed Susan. Oh, I love those, yeah. Yeah, fun to grow. Morning glories and moonflowers. And essentially, they twist around a, a fence or a support and grab a good, they they intertwine is what they do. I guess that's the best way to put it. They do. So I think when most people think of vines, this is generally what they're thinking. The kind of thing that swirls and climbs up. It's structured like a boa constrictor. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally surrounding right. it. Um, and did you know that they may grow clockwise or cl counterclockwise depending on the species? I did know that. As a matter of fact, there's an old ballad about woodbine, which I think some people refer to honeysuckle as woodbine, and a morning glory or bittersweet. So bittersweet is counterclockwise. Morning glories are clockwise. <laughs> and they fell in love with each other, but because they rotate in different directions, they went straight up and fell over and the relationship didn't work out. I'll just drop it right there. <laughs> but you make a good point, and it's fun to watch that. And then I ask myself, Stacy, does it depend what hemisphere you're in? That's a good question. I don't yeah. know. Like the water in the, uh, in the toilet bowl. We, well, <laughs> if you head down to the southern hemisphere, you can do some observations for us. <laughs> we need some divine intervention. Okay, and then the ramblers. Uh, and the most famous of the ramblers, Stacy, has got to be the roses. Yes, rambling rose. Mm -hmm. Although not all roses are ramblers. I mean, a rambling rose, this is probably the most squishy category, I guess, of squishy. vines. <laughs> Because a Ramblin' Rose really just has long, flexible canes that can be sort of turned into vines. But if it doesn't have a means of support, it's just going to ramble on the ground. Yeah, exactly. I like to call them hook climbers. 
uh, because of the thorns that they have. But we, these types of vines, uh, we have to give them a little bit of support, sometimes tie them up yes. and, uh, and deal with them that way. Yeah, the, you can't leave them to their own devices. And then the clingers, the clingers. We're going to talk about a pretty neat clinger in plants on trial today. At least I call it a clinger or aerial roots on some plants. And what comes to mind are your ivies, your trumpet vine, climbing hydrangea. These, uh, these are the plants that have adventitious airborne roots and grab a hold and hang on. Yeah, and uh, those roots are actually what help it climb, and they, they occur on new growth, and they actually help it to grip to the surface. And the nice thing about this type of vine is that, unlike we were talking about with the tendrils, that they need a lot of surface area, these can pretty much cling to a flat surface. Yeah. Maybe not like a piece of stainless steel that's totally smooth. But a brick wall. But a brick wall, mm. wood, rock, all of that kind of stuff. They can easily cling to that uh, with just a little bit of help from you to suggest the direction that you would like them to go. Um, but that gives you a lot of advantages when you are trying to use a vine for ornamental, you know, qualities or to cover something. Uh, it will help you if you don't have that surface area for tendril vines. Yeah. And there's no question that vines are opportunistic. I mean, think about the weeds that we consider vines from the parasitic tendrils of dotter, bindweed, kudzu where you're on a country road, and if you sit at a stop sign too long, it can grow right into the window of your car. I mean, amazing stuff. The uh, toxic woody clinger poison ivy. Uh, of course, weeds get into the act uh, too. But with those tendril type or twining vines, I have found, Stacy, that sometimes you got to show them who's boss. Let's say a wisteria. In other words, they'd like to grow and grow and grow and foliate in lieu of blooming. And sometimes you got to put them under a little stress. You really do. Uh, wisteria is notorious for that. Mm -hmm. And when people get a wisteria and add it to their garden, they think, oh, I'm going to do so much. I'm going to make it the perfect home. I am going to make this wisteria the pride of the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And I'm going to water it. And I'm going to fertilize it. And I'm going to dust it. And it never does anything. Because exactly. that's, you know, they, they really do need some tough love. Um, although you know, I was just driving down south and uh, the wisteria down there is invasive, the Japanese wisteria, and it needs no help. It's <laughs> It was blooming everywhere, which was lovely, although a little disconcerting to, to when, when it's flowering and you really see how widespread it is. Um, but that just goes to show you that too much care yeah. and they're not going to flower, whereas if they're just kind of left to do their thing and not overly cared for. Now, a lot of horticulturists, um, particularly at public gardens, will do quite a lot of pruning on wisteria to get it to cover something specifically. A lot of times they will also reduce the number of flower clusters so that they are larger and okay. more dramatic. Um, but do not ever be afraid to prune wisteria, unless, of course, it's at the wrong time, which would be early spring, and then you'd be cutting off the flower buds. But after it blooms, that's when you prune a wisteria. And, you know, short of it being a brand new plant with just a few inches to work with, I don't think you could really over prune no, I agree. A wisteria. You can do some root pruning with wisterias. Again, you have to show these plants who are boss. Morning glories also. A little bit of stress is good. I have found it will help them uh, bloom. Uh, as far as house plants are concerned, I wanted to mention to you, Stacy, that the uh, Rapidophora, which uh, like uh, proven winners, Leaf Joy has a monster mash, Swiss cheese vine. Those are great for indoor vining. And then our word of the day is thigmotropism. Thigmotropism. Plant tendrils respond to physical touch. That's thigmotropism. So you can put that in your portfolio now. And I like that. Yeah, I like that word. That's pretty cool. So does that mean we can call tendrils thigmajiggies? Thigmajiggies. <laughs> well done. I like that. We'll put it in the show notes. Annual vines, of course. Uh, Stacy. you know that I love purple hyacinth bean or oh, scarlet so pretty. bean. Yeah, just so pretty. They're, they're neon purple, gorgeous, puts on a show just for an inexpensive seed packet at the start of spring. You put those in the ground, you're going to get months and months of enjoyment quite cheaply. Well, you know, I think you made a really good point there, and that is that you just put them in the ground. Yeah. There's no need to start those things indoors. Once the soil's warm enough, you stick them out there. And then within a matter of months, you have an absolutely fabulous vine covered in flowers. And both the hyacinth vine and the scarlet runner bean that you mentioned are edible as well, flowers and fruit. Beautiful.
We're going to vine things down here on the first segment and move on to plants on trial. You won't want to miss this, and it's going to follow the vine theme. And coming up later in the show, we're going to talk birds. Love your outfit. Thank you. I wore this bird sweater, especially for our guest, the Birdman. Outstanding. That's all coming up here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, and you get to decide if you want to add it to your garden or not. Today's plant on trial is, of course, a vine, To in keeping with Rick's notes in the first segment. And the plant that we're talking about is Rose Sensation Japanese hydrangea vine. Have you seen this one, Rick? Love it. Love it. Yes. It is beautiful. a beautiful plant. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm hoping so. We've only got a few minutes to cover this, and I've got a lot to cover. So I'm going to just <laughs> say right off the bat, listeners, um, it's going to get confusing here. Bear with me. If it gets too confusing, everything will be in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Because I have to start right off the bat with a taxonomic conundrum. Oh, and I know that's an identity a lot. crisis. <laughs> we talk about simplifying gardening here, not making it more complicated. Um, but I, I have to address this because it's kind of like an elephant in the room that the horticulture industry is dealing with right now. So, Rose- Stacy, no one better than you to deal <laughs> with numbing nomenclature. <laughs> oh, so go you. at it. I'll just sit back and watch. Okay, if you're driving, pinch yourself. Don't fall asleep. No, this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is. I hope this is interesting. I think it's interesting. So. Um, <laughs> Japanese hydrangea vine used to be known as false hydrangea vine, and botanically, it was known as Schizophragma hydrangeoides. So probably the most popular example of this plant that might, people might be familiar with is Moonlight. I'm sure you sold that when you worked at garden centers. Yes. Very popular plant. And it was called false hydrangea vine because it was known botanically as Schizophragma and not hydrangea. So they're related. They're in the same botanical family, the hydrangeaceae or the saxifragaceae, depending on uh, what your take is there, but botanically closely related. The real difference between schizophragma and hydrangea anomala, which is known as the climbing hydrangea, is that the flowers of the schizophragma, the sterile florets along the outside of the lace cap flowers, they were just a single sail-shaped petal. When I say sail, I mean S-A-I-L, like a sailboat. Not S-A-L-E. No. <laughs> Operators are standing by. Place your order now. No, go no, ahead. No, yeah. So it was like a little, shaped like a little sail on a sailboat, just a single petal on those sterile florets. Whereas hydrangea anomala, or the climbing hydrangea, had what looked like an actual hydrangea floret with like the four little petals that you would, act, you know, if you were drawing a picture of a flower, that would be mm-hmm. sort of what you got. So because it didn't have these like true hydrangea-looking, sterile florets, taxonomists classified it as a schizophragma or false hydrangea vine. Well, taxonomists are like the rest of us. They change their mind about things based on research and a further evaluation. And it recently rocked the horticultural world that taxonomists had decided to change schizophragma hydrangeoides to hydrangea hydrangeoides. And If I had a dime for every time I became confused, I'd be like, where did all these dimes come from? (laughs) I like like that. So in in many ways, this is actually a simplification, right? Because schizophragma is... I'm glad you can keep it straight because I can't. I admit it. Well, so schizophragma, it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. It's a hard word to say. And false hydrangea vine is just like, well, why would I want a false hydrangea vine when I could have a real hydrangea vine? (laughs) So I think all of these names, both the common and scientific name, really did a disservice to this plant. So from a horticultural perspective, we're all thrilled that this is now hydrangea hydrangeoides. But we're stuck with a little bit of a conundrum ourselves, which is, yeah, we can no longer call a plant named hydrangea hydrangeoides a false hydrangea vine because what could be more fully hydrangea than hydrangea hydrangeoides? It's the ultimate that, you know, you can pretty much do when it comes to botanical nomenclature. Amazing. Yeah, it is. Just amazing. I don't know. Yeah. I just don't get it, but I'm glad you do and and some other people do because... Well, you know, all of this is ultimately arbitrary. And whether you get a climbing hydrangea, hydrangea anomala, or a false hydrangea vine, or what we're now calling the Japanese hydrangea vine, formerly known as schizophragma, they're both beautiful plants, and they will be grown the same way. Okay, so let me ask you a quick question on the plant for our listeners then. I mean, so I'm supposed to call it 
Japanese hydrangea? Yes, that's the name we're going to go Can I call it a climbing hydrangea? So, I mean... Maybe. Maybe. Whatever. Uh, you know, again, if, if you get <laughs> the plant beautiful. that you want at it's the end gorgeous. of the day, that's what matters. But you do need to understand that, you know... Aesthetically, from afar, they're going to look the same. Yeah. Okay. At the climbing hydrangea and the fall and the Japanese hydrangea vine. But the difference is again that that Japanese hydrangea vine is not going to have that little four-petaled hydrangea-looking florets on its edge. Okay. It's still going to have just that single sh sail-shaped petal. Both beautiful, both fabulous. Yeah. But those that will be the difference between them. Well, and it'll be clear to anyone who's watching us on YouTube because Adriana, I'm sure, will be posting yes. pictures of those beautiful sail-like. Florets, you call them. Yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, is this plant like uh, the other, I'm going to call it a climbing hydrangea from years back. Sure. The, uh, the kind that does the sleep, creep, leap thing. In other words, it starts out kind of slow, but then once it gets going, wow, this thing covers a lot of ground. Yes, that is absolutely true. So, skies of fry, or sorry. Hydrangea, hydrangea. Now, I've, had, call you on that. I've had years of calling this plant. I mean, I've been using this plant in gardens since I was in college, so it's, it's a big change for me. But um, yeah, both of them are going to be fairly slow growing, and they're going to take some time to get established. And by established, I mean it's going to take them some time to grow roots and to start to climb up their structure. And when so many people buy these plants, whether it's a climbing hydrangea or a Japanese hydrangea vine, um, they don't necessarily realize that the plant is not going to cling to anything in its first year. Yeah. And that's because it, they have this unusual habit of having sort of a determinate growth. So we talk, when we talked about tomatoes a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. we talked about determinate tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Basically what that means is they have one fruit set and that's it. They don't continue to produce fruit all season long. When it comes to plant growth, what determinant growth means is that it basically has like a spurt of growth in the spring and then doesn't really grow a whole lot through the rest of the season. So it's only on that spring growth okay. that these hydrangea vines are going to be able to create those rootlets because these are clingers um, to actually start to climb up the structure. And so what that means for you as someone who's planting one a lot of times they come on some sort of little trellis kind of thing. Sure. But you're going to want to make sure that that trellis uh, is aimed at or supported with some bamboo stakes or something like that to help suggest to it where you will want it to go the following spring when that new growth emerges and does finally start to cling. And it's really only once these plants have started to establish themselves and grow vigorously onto their structure. And they are going to need a good, strong structure. Um, it's only then that they will actually start to grow well and to flower. So I have heard from so many gardeners, oh, I've planted a, a hydrangea vine X number of years ago. It's still not flowering. It can take four to seven years for wow. these plants to flower. Wow. And that might be a little bit of a, a downer for some people, and especially with hydrangeas, because most people are used to hydrangeas being a really reliable bloomer from a young age. You know, many people plant a hydrangea and get great flowers right. that same year. Many of them right. plant a hydrangea, it's already flowering when they plant it. Wow. So it's important to understand this is a plant that's going to need some patience. So you're going to want to cite it carefully. This is going to be a long-term plant, not something that you will plan to, you know, move or have to tear out because that's not going to be an easy job. And in our trial gardens, we have climbing hydrangeas and Japanese hydrangea vines growing on a number of the trees. And they are beautiful. They are some of the most mature and beautiful climbing hydrangeas that you are going to see. And a lot of people ask us if they harm the trees. And uh, they don't, and they've been that way for many years. But I think this this idea of these vines being harmful to trees mm -hmm. really derives from ivy. And I think I've even yeah. talked about this a bit on the show. I agree. Because ivy is a plant that has a juvenile growth phase and a mature growth phase. And the juvenile growth phase, it's just a leafy little guy just growing. It's no problem. Once it reaches that mature phase, it becomes basically a shrub. And then you have a full-on woody shrub growing up in your tree. It, it becomes very, very woody. It becomes very, very heavy. That doesn't happen with the Japanese hydrangea vine and the climbing hydrangea. So you're not going to get that issue of really heavy, thick growth way up at the top of the tree that's toppling branches. You don't have to worry about it getting under the bark and harming the tree. It just you know clings to that outer level of bark. We have them growing on... Um, on uh, Cottonwood trees. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, nice thick bark really for them rough, to cling thick on. Bark. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so, rose sensation, 
I, I didn't even hardly get to the flowers or what makes rose sensation hydrangea vine, Japanese hydrangea vine special. But those little sail-like petals, they're sort of like painted with a marbled pink. They, it really is beautiful and it really is very different. Um, but this is a plant that you are, again, going to want to, to cite for the long term. Not one that you can say, ah, I changed my mind. I'm going to move it. This is, you know, usually Rick and I are in full support of changing your mind and moving things around. And that's how we both garden. This is not going to be one of those plants. So if you're thinking about planting a climbing hydrangea or Japanese hydrangea vine like Rose Sensation in your garden, definitely do your research first. And the easiest way to do that and get started is by going to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and reading the show notes. Wow. I know. I packed a lot into that. I, I barely let you get a word in edgewise. That's okay. You got to read between <laughs> the vine print. I'm glad. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm glad that you studied at an Academy of Vine Arts because uh, <laughs> that was outstanding. All right. We'll leaf it at that. <laughs> All right. So listen, we've got to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, we're going to be answering your garden questions and you won't want to miss it. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. We're about to answer the gardening questions we've gotten in the last week. If you have a question for us, you can email it to us at help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and fill out the contact form. And, you know, we've been talking about vines, and there's so much to say about vines. I didn't even get to tell you what one of my favorite vines is. Yeah, what is it, Stacey? It is um, the begonia vine. Have you ever oh, seen those before? Yes. So it's not a begonia. It's actually related to grape, um, but they are so beautiful. And they used to be so popular and easy wow. to find. And I feel like they have unfortunately kind of fallen out of favor because I haven't seen one at a garden center in some time. And I would absolutely love to grow them there. Bright purple and silver and um, really, really very cool plants. But Beautiful. Well, I'll tell you what, another favorite, and I know it's a favorite of a lot of our viewers and listeners, and that is clematis or clematis, however you want to pronounce it, and proven winners, color choice shrubs. Stacy, I can't believe the varieties you have. They're incredible. They've taken clematis to a whole new level. They have, and you know what? We've picked them to specifically to be easy care Yeah. because have, people have so many. I would say clematis are probably second to hydrangeas in people's confusion yeah. and uh, disappointment that Correct. they've had because they're hard to understand. So next show, we're talking a ton about clematis, and so please do mark your calendars so you next don't week. miss that or subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you definitely won't miss it, or subscribe to our podcast, and you won't right. miss it. So many ways to not miss the Clematis Show, which is coming up next week. But uh, let's answer the garden mailbag questions. What do we got this week, Rick? All right, so Brad asks us, uh, we have a few mature maple trees in our yard, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions of what would be good to plant underneath them. Great question. Something that a lot of people struggle with. Stacy, maple trees can be very densely foliated, and so it becomes difficult to grow under them. Now, from my experience, I think people scratch their head and say, well, it's because of the dense shade. But I think, Stacy, a lot of it is the root competition from these maple trees. Yeah, the roots are definitely the far bigger challenge. It's easy to fall somewhat easy to find plants that will tolerate deep shade. It's a lot harder to not only find plants that can can tolerate that competition, but that you as a gardener can get in a small enough size that you can actually plant them yeah. amongst that, you know, rooty, hard earth. That's, you know, I think one of the biggest issues. So one thing I recommend to people a lot uh, in this situation is to look for things that are in like landscape flats. And a lot of garden centers sell yeah, these, sure. you know, where it's just a whole bunch of rooted cuttings that you can kind of pull apart. And then you're just planting, you know, like a single stem rather than trying to dig a hole for like a one quart or something like that. So um, I think that's one of the biggest issues. And then of course water, right. because established trees are far more effective competitors for water than a, a new little perennial cutting that you just planted. So they are going to need a lot more water than you would normally, you know, think to think that a that's new perennial would be. Exactly need. the problem. And the elephant in the room is many people want to be able to grow turf under maple trees and turf and trees turf and maple trees are simply not compatible because of the root competition because of the water issue and the light issue now if you have large mature maple trees one thing i would consider is employing an arborist in the winter to do some pruning that's one mm -hmm. thing that can help 
I've also been help, able to help people through the years who do want some type of vegetation growing under the maple tree to consider trying annual rye or some type of annual grass, understanding that you're going to have to replant it, but at least you have some cover. And then, of course, Stacy, yes, many, many great ground covers that you can put under maple trees. I've had, because of their root system, I've had a lot of success with uh, dwarf daylilies under maple trees. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. That that makes sense. Um, I would say definitely avoid any invasive ground covers. And a lot of those ones, you know, that's, that's tricky yeah. because you're going to want those plants that are so you know, aggressive and able to outcompete the trees, but things like periwinkle or vinca vine, you know, that can become a much bigger issue through your yard and you don't want to, uh, oh, to try to vine. resolve your maple issue and then end up making, you know, a huge issue out in your lawn. So I would say definitely avoid that. Even if someone says, Oh, it's super tough, plant it. You'll be fine. Avoid that. Avoid English Ivy as well. Same kind of situation. A couple that I thought to consider here were a Juga perennial geranium, Carex, uh, even Brennera, which you might not be able mm -hmm. to find small, but should do well. It's, it's yep. tolerant of dry shade. And then maybe if you can dig some holes, winter creeper, euonymus, and some ferns, like especially low growing ferns, you might be able, if it's, if it's not too dry under there, you might be able to get those going. But you know, another issue we were talking about, you were talking about timing and pruning maples in the winter to get some sun down there. I think it's very important, Brad, that you plant these in spring so that they get time to get established. So when those maple leaves fall and you have to rake or blow or whatever sure. you do to, to take care of those leaves, you're not pulling up your investment along with those. So the sooner you can get these plants in once it's growing season, you know, and they, they can get established, the better off you're going to be in the long run. But be patient and definitely be out there, be vigilant with the water and probably, you know, they're going to need more water than you would expect. Yeah, one plant that I'd add to your list, uh, Stacy, that I've had success with and Proven Winners has one that is called All Gold. It's a Hackanacloa. Oh. Am I pronouncing that mm -hmm. right? Hackanacloa. So it's like a grass. I've seen that perform really well under trees or in shady areas. So we'll add that one to the list. Yeah, uh, I, and also. it's so pretty. And uh, they often do call that the shade grass. It's actually the common name is Japanese forest grass, which yes. kind of implies that it will grow under trees. So that's a nice choice. Uh, Roger's looking for perennials over two feet tall for shade in USDA zone seven. Great question, Roger. I uh, I love that. Stacy, uh, a still be. Proven Winners has a crested surf Japanese painted firm. Love that. Uh, I like foamy bells and, of course, your hostas, the Shadowland hostas. There's one called Above the Clouds. This year's uh, National Plant of the Year, Empress Wu. Those would all work great. Yeah, Empress Wu is well over two feet. So a oh, lot yeah, of times people are probably thinking, I've never seen a two-foot tall hosta. Uh, but, yeah, you, Empress Wu is, I think, can be like four or five feet Close tall four feet, if yes. it has enough water. And certainly in USDA Zone 7, where you're going to have a nice, long, mild uh, growing season, if you can give it some water, it will easily be over two feet feet tall. But, you know, I thought this was an interesting question to kind of contrast with Brad's question about ground cover, because Brad is obviously looking for low growing plants that kind of, you know, mimic the feel mm -hmm. and look of turf can maybe take even a little bit of foot traffic. Um, whereas Roger's looking for these taller things. And the biggest question when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, when, it, when it comes to recommending any perennial is dry or moist soil. Right. Because dry shade and moist shade are very, very different mm -hmm. situations. And so I think that it's important that you understand that. So if you have moist shade, I think ferns are an incredible choice. Yes. And, you know, similar to the hostas, there are some ferns that are quite tall. Um, I have Dryopteris australis, which is also known as the Dixie wood fern, and I grow it in dry soil, so it doesn't get as tall as it could, but that can easily get to be five feet tall, and it's sure. just a beautiful native fern. Um, toad lily, Tricertus, mm -hmm. is another great choice that gets fairly tall, and you know, another one that I love is Aruncus, also known as goat's beard. Oh, yeah, goat's beard. The, beautiful, like, white flowers yep, on it, right? Yep, mm -hmm. so big, foamy white flowers, extremely durable, tough native plant, um, and I think that would be a great choice. So we will put all of those on the uh, show notes at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. You know, Roger, if you ask a couple people like Stacy and myself, we could go on and on all day 
filling your list and you'd go uh, you'd go broke. But I, I do have to mention Ligularia, yeah. uh, Big Leaf Ligularia, the Rocket. Uh, Proven Winners has one called Bottle Rocket, which is great. And then, Stacy, we do have to mention Sun King Aurelia. Oh, I love that plant. Gorgeous color. Bright yellow color in the shade. Grows to about 36 inches tall. So I'd recommend Sun King Aurelia also. So, yeah, lots of great choices. Don't get us started. Well, I guess we did get you started. We got started. <laughs> we did get started. <laughs> but you'll find that list at Gardening Simplified on air.com. So we got time for one more quick question. All right. Oh, so, yeah. So Frauka is wondering how and when do you prune a Harry Louder's walking stick? One of my absolute favorite mm-hmm. plants. Um, it has drooping leaves, too, she says, which might be due to too little irrigation. So Harry Lauder's walking stick is a very cool plant. It's a hazelnut, related to a hazelnut, and it has very um, contorted branches. Uh, but these plants are one that you do not want to cut back or, or trim into any kind of formal way. You actually are going to want to take out entire branches. So what you're going to want to do now is a great time to do this, even though you will be removing any flowers. Not really a problem. The flowers are interesting, but it's not going to harm the plant. So I would get a pair of loppers, nice sharp blades on those loppers, and take out the branches that you no longer want at the base. And that's the best way to try to control it. I would not really attempt to control the height of this plant because it, they don't get super tall anyway, um, but it's definitely a kind of plant you want to control on the width. And I would say, don't worry at all about the drooping leaves because that's what this plant does. Yeah. Every time I've grown it, those leaves, they do, it always does kind of look like it needs a drink, but I think that's just part of the contorted growth of the plant. Love the plant. I'm going to put an exclamation point on your explanation because I couldn't have said it better. All right. Excellent. So thank you so much for your questions. If you have more, you can always reach us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking to the Birdman and you won't want to miss that. So please do stay tuned. It's time for branching news here on the Gardening Simplified show. And Stacy, this week we talk birds. I had a friend share with me yesterday from a, a website called thequotegarden.com. And I knew you would like this, Stacy. Uh, the quote was, my favorite weather is bird chirping weather. Oh, that's so true. And it's so descriptive of what's happening right now. The exactly. the melodies are back. Exactly. And what better time to have him swoop in? Then the Birdman, Bill Stovall, here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Bill, thanks for joining us today. Oh, a pleasure. Nice to talk to you again, Rick. So, Bill, uh, you have shared with me in the past, uh, you know, I talk about birdhouses, and I love putting up birdhouses, was thrilled to see some tree swallows take up residence in a birdhouse that I got from you. Uh, But you essentially call it blue birding. What do you mean by blue birding? Is it because we really don't know who's going to move in, even though we want a certain species to move in? That's exactly right. Uh, the size of the entrance hole in the house that you put up is uh, normally or often an inch and a half, which is the right size for a bluebird. And everybody emphasizes bluebirds and wants bluebirds, but they're not always going to get bluebirds because they have to put the house in the in a place where there's fields and open spaces to get blue birds. Sure. If they put it in a woodsy area, then they'll get some of the other wonderful birds that come to your bird feeder all winter. So uh, you can put out the welcome mat, but it's not going to ensure the fact that you're going to get uh, you're going to get a bluebird. But I guess we should just be happy with what we get because spring is that that nesting time, that time to put out birdhouses, right? Exactly right. By the way, it's time to clean them out if you haven't cleaned them out yet. Okay. Ooh, good to know. And is it, safe, know. is it safe to do that? Because I know a lot of people maybe feel a little bit concerned, oh, that some birds are habitual or return to the nests. And if you go to a lot of nature preserves and so forth, it'll say, oh, leave nests if you find them undisturbed. So is it okay to go ahead and clean out the nest, particularly if you don't know what had been nesting in it the previous season? Well, uh if it's not cleaned out, the chances are that the uh, the previous nester is not going to return to it because there's no room in the box. Ah, mm. okay. That makes good sense. And, and at this point in time, uh, they're not going to be nesting. It's before they've decided to take up nesting. So you're clearing out last year's, uh, last year's furniture. <laughs> so yeah, it's exactly. good to do it now. 
and you can just brush out the inside and, and then it'll be ready for the next the next habitat. So you don't need to worry about like bleach or wa- soap and water or anything like that? Just taking out Not, the old debris if, is fine? If, if, if there had been a, a, a mouse in there and it was bad, then you can use some like vinegar water okay. and just wipe it out a little bit. But uh, when they put a, when the nest is put in a house, it, it's up above uh, the, the actual wood floor anyhow so mm. it's it's not that critical but it's good to get it as clean as you can sure. but don't blow in it and get the dust in your nose oh yeah. gosh that's good mm. advice <laughs> yeah whoa uh so bill i like to leave some landscape residue laying around for the birds uh the inflorescence on uh, ornamental grasses i see them pick that up or other things uh, as a matter of fact uh i've seen a bird go by before with a cigarette butt in its mouth that's that's quite a thing to see you see a bird <laughs> fly by with a marlboro in its mouth but you know they're collecting up this kind of stuff and and feathering their nest so to speak right Yes, and it might be after they've met with their mate, too. You just never know how they deal with cigarettes, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it just popped into my head, but I have seen it. But but your your landscape materials. <laughs> your, exactly right. Your, it's, bird, it's birdnacular is what we're doing here. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to collect up materials and make that nest for, uh, for the long haul the next few months. Well, they'll scout around and find bits of wine and, and, and uh, twine and, and uh, grass pieces and feathers and that type of thing. Uh, which brings me to the next point. A, a, a bluebird, one that nests, nests primarily with, with straw and, and grass and, uh, and small uh, soft things and makes a little round nest a lot like a robin's nest. Okay. But a tree swallow is likely to be in one of your boxes also. And they just have uh, sticks, and, and but they often have feathers. They look all over for feathers to put into their nest. Okay. Mm. Okay. And then a wren is one of my favorite birds. They just chatter all the time, but their nests are all sticks. So okay. if you found a, find a house that has all sticks in it with a kind of a little cavity down in the middle of the sticks, that will be your house wren. Oh, I love that. I find a lot of goldfinch nests uh, out here in West Michigan being near the lakeshore, and they're always um, abundant with fluff, you know, fluff from cattails and dandelions and all of that kind of thing. Now, Bill, I'm a knitter, uh, so when I'm not gardening or birding, I'm often knitting or crocheting, and a lot of uh, knitters and crocheters will say, oh, you know, leave your yarn ends, put them in a suet feeder for the birds. Do you recommend that or no? I've heard different opinions on that. Uh, if, if it's not going to tangle them up, uh, they'll, they'll choose it if they like it, okay. um, and and they'll use it. Uh, when you talk about the, the kind of weaving that you get from Orioles and or the, the finches that you're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, that's pretty intricate, and it, it helps to have something binded like that. But okay. there are lots of natural and, and um, uh, man-made things that all work well in a nest. My much-anticipated spring bird, Bill, are Baltimore Orioles, but you've taught me they're not necessarily... Baltimore Orioles, anyhow. I mean, why does Baltimore get to have all the fun, right? Well, somebody changed the name recently to Northern Oriole, and I wondered why. (laughs) Because the story goes that uh, when uh, people were coming to this country, Lord Baltimore chose one place in Maryland, and they call it Baltimore, Maryland, and his family colors were the same colors as that Oriole, ah. orange and black and white. And that's the reason that that bird got the name of Baltimore's Oriole. Oh, mm. I did well, not know that. It was, it's very interesting, and I don't know why they changed it, but it's a, it's a great little tale. And it's, if you ever uh, look into the clothing of that time, you'll see that they're, they were bright. Uh, family colors were very bright and very elegant. Wow. Like, like the Baltimore Oriole. And they're also a bird that makes a hanging woven nest, just like we were talking about. If you look around right now, uh, above the, up in the tips of the trees and that, you may find something that looks like a sock hanging down. Hmm. That was left by a Baltimore Oriole. Interesting. Yeah, I do see those, especially out here and, you know, near the water. Now, my neighbor uh, puts out grape jelly and, and, Orioles often come to my hummingbird feeders as well. And then we see them for, you know, perhaps a month, and then they disappear. So where do they go? 
Well, they're, they're coming through. Uh, an, an oriole is what they call a neotropical bird. It, it winters in South America and then comes across. That's one reason it's late getting here. It's also waiting for the bugs to come out so it has things to eat. But they're migrating through uh, at the beginning of that time that you get such a, a, a lot of eating of the orange and the grape jelly. But several pairs will stay and nest here, and the rest are moving on north. Mm. But the thing that they do is instead of, they're harder to see when the leaves come out, mm. and they're a tree top dweller mostly. That's where a lot of their feeding goes on. So they're here, but you don't see them as often. Wow. But if you are if you continue with the grape jelly, we've had Orioles year-round. I mean, I mean, until they go south again. Right, through the season. But uh, all, all summer long coming in, uh, along with the uh, hummingbirds. So Baltimore Orioles, one of those birds that has a lot of frequent flyer miles on an annual basis. Very interesting. Some favorite birds here a minute, Bill, because we've got to ask about this. I was surprised to learn that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stacy, but that Stacy, like you, likes turkey vultures, and Adriana here in the studio likes loons. Let's touch on turkey vultures first. Turkey vulture is also one of my favorite birds. They are the most graceful uh, flyers up there in the sky when they're swooping around. They're the most sensitive smell. Most birds don't have very much sense of Mm. of smell, but uh, uh, that's how turkey vultures find their uh, their dead uh, meals is by the the smell of the carcasses as they as they go. So uh, then they swoop around until they catch a little whiff of that way up there, way up high, and they can still smell it. It's amazing. Wow. Why then do you, they circle why do you around like and come turkey, down and get it. Why do you like turkey vultures, Stacy? Oh gosh, they're they're just fascinating, and um, you know they're so common. And people really freak out when they see them, right. and particularly if they get an up-close view. I mean, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert birder. I'm a beginning birder. But they are a bird that more people have probably asked me about. My friends, um, you know, will text me a picture of one having landed in their backyard. And I have a lot of friends in Ann Arbor, and they land in backyards in Ann Arbor all the time. I have never seen a turkey vulture in my backyard uh, <laughs> here in West Michigan. And they're, oh, my gosh, there's this huge black bird in my yard. What do I do? Is it okay? <laughs> you know, and they're kind of freaking out. And um, you know, it's kind of one of those things, too, where people a lot of times think of turkey vultures as, you know, gross. They have their bare heads. But I find them, uh, like like you do, Bill, very graceful and, and fascinating. And they do an extremely important service for the ecosystem by cleaning up dead stuff. And I'd rather the turkey vultures eat it than me smell it. So, Oh, that's, that's their job is to, is to clean up. And we have them come into our yard fairly regularly. My wife doesn't let me bring home roadkill anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. <laughs> that's a that's a federal offense, there, Bill. <laughs> it's a federal offense. Uh, don't get too close. Their breath isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine so. How about Adriana's loons? I know you have loons in the area where you live, uh, Bill. Why why the interest in loons on the part of people? Well, loons are are. Uh, have been threatened and on the threatened species list for a long time because uh, people like lakes and loons like lakes and their habitat is being squashed. And uh, about 30 years ago, uh, we at our lake found that we had a pair of nesting loons and wanted to help preserve them and started the, or I helped start the uh, Michigan uh, Loon Preservation Association, which, uh, and they have loon rangers that watch for loons and put <laughs> out nesting ranger. platforms. <laughs> yeah, put out nesting platforms for them to be safe on because the uh, platform is like a, an island and it raises and lowers as the water goes up and down. And it's off the edge of the uh, lake where uh, raccoons can walk along and find and, and destroy the eggs. So it's a much safer place. And then we put out two uh, buoys out in front of the, the that as a do not disturb signs while they're nesting. Mm. And, and Once they come off the nest, they don't go back to the nest, but uh, they're on the nest for about 28 days. Mm. And do you have, um, you know, advice or uh, guides on the website on how people who want to conserve loons uh, can, can do something similar like that to on the lakes that they live on? If they would uh, be in touch with the uh, Michigan Audubon mm. or uh, Michigan Loon Preservation Association. Just not uh, just look those two names up. Uh, there are directions on 
uh, how to how to take care and how to beware of, of the loons and help protect them. And they need to be watched, need to be not chased by speedboats and, and yeah. jet skis. Yeah. Uh, you can't, uh, and when they have their babies, their babies are uh, with them uh, all summer long until they can learn to fly. And they're such a big bird and heavy bone bird because they dive that it takes them a long time for the chicks to learn how to fly. Mm. So uh, they're, they're vulnerable all summer long when, when they're there. So yes. it's, it's a, and they're a gorgeous bird. They're a oh. large bird. And, yeah. and that, that loon call is used in more movies where it shouldn't. There are no loons around, but they like the sound of it. <laughs> it is a very iconic song. I, I grew up um, camping at Interlochen State Park, and there were always nesting loons on Duck Lake there. And for me, it is just a sound that takes me right back to being a kid and waking up in the tent with my mom and dad and just having a, a great day camping. So it's it's a lovely bird and a lovely song. For our viewers. Well, I was the same way. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, oh, Derek. Bill. No, that's fine, Bill. Go ahead. Um. I used to go to Canada with my uh, with my folks for vacations, and then when I moved, uh, when I got the property here in uh, Delton, uh, we had loons, and I said, "Oh, they're the loons," and I didn't think another thing about it because I just assumed they were always around. Mm -hmm. And then to discover they were the southernmost pair in the United States, and uh, we've been very successful over the last years of fledging the ones that uh, that are nesting. It takes them about five years to to begin to. Uh, uh, propagate again to begin to mate. Uh, and this last two years, we've had another pair a at Crooked Lake, which is just uh, uh, a few yards north of, of, of where we are. So we're still the southernmost, but not by many feet. <laughs> uh, and Crooked Lake, right here in Delton, right downtown Delton, uh, has had uh, two pairs of or, uh, two uh, pro uh, nestings, successful nestings in the last two years. Well, I'm sure the southernmost loon nesting site would be a title you'd gladly give up if it meant more loons nesting in the area, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Bill, uh, got to ask you, uh, for, again, for our YouTube viewers, uh, Stacy dressed for the occasion here, uh, Sandhill Cranes. There's a real fascination coast to coast for Sandhill Cranes. Tell us a little bit about Sandhill Cranes. Well, sandhill cranes, one of, well, the cranes in general are some of the oldest birds that we have. There are fossils of cranes that go back millions and millions of years. Our sandhill crane uh, has been around for, you know, 10,000 years, but we almost lost them here. Now that uh, they're, they've given some amount of, kind of protection to them, uh, I've counted as many as 5,000 at one time. Uh, they at the uh, big marsh in Marshall uh, when they count cranes at the the first of November, they often have ten thousand wow. that uh, leave in the same day. So they made a tremendous comeback. Wow. But it's just been by taking care of them and uh, and giving them space and and uh, but they are so significant. They're just beautiful. And a whooping crane. We have a whooping crane down here too. Oh wow! Gotten gotten sidetracked. And keeps coming back with a, a flock of sandhill cranes, <laughs> but the ho ho whooping cranes are uh, even more uh, protected, and uh, there are much fewer of those. But they're coming back too. So, uh, you know, I I see a lot of uh, sandhill cranes at this time of year. If you're driving along the highway, you'll see them out in cornfields, in the stubble of the cornfields. And um, it made me wonder, you know, what are they eating? Are they strictly, you know, seed and plant eaters or, or what are they foraging for? No, they eat little, little uh, worms and things also, but seeds and uh, corn and... Uh, uh, they're, they're vegetarians in a, to a great degree, mm -hmm. and a few little bugs, but uh, just it's pretty much grasses and, and water things like that. But they wander along the edges of streams, and, and they're a nuisance to a lot of the farmers because they'll uh, spot that these uh, corn stalks are just coming up, and they're about three inches tall, and it's perfect because it's a nice little bite, and yeah. it's got a, something on the end, and mm -hmm. and uh, so the farmers uh, have a problem with them, but they're. Uh, uh, if it's too much of a problem, I, the farmer can talk to the Department of Natural Resources and kind of shoo them off their, their fields. Mm. But uh, if it's left, left to themselves, they really are, are expanding in their territories. 
So similar to my question to you earlier about where do the Baltimore Orioles go, you know, I know for myself, um, you know, sandhill cranes are super easy to see right now. You kind of can't not see them, whether they're honking overhead or or in the fields. So, you know, when it does get to be a little bit later, and I tend to maybe only see them if we're hiking in a remote area and it's it's a, a water area, you know, back where not that many people go. So where do they go a little bit later in the season? They can, a lot of them continue to go farther and farther north, all the way up to the Arctic Circle. Oh, wow. And, and uh, when this is one of the stations where they seem to, to gather, in uh, September, October, November, uh, they, they flock together here, and then they all fly south together. So we're likely to see them in this particular uh, area, Grand Rapids, uh, Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, Marshall, uh, Jackson, uh, and, uh, and their flocks of, of 125 or 500 or, you know, uh, that you see. But they now they're going to start to... Uh, pair up two by two and find their nesting spots. And as that happens, uh, they're going to guard those nesting spots and shoot the other, uh, the other ones up on up north. Mm. So they're starting their breeding uh, uh, functions right now. Bill, if a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or in this case, a proven winner's color choice shrub, I got to mention two birds I love: indigo buntings. And uh, herons. Uh, I live on the shoreline of Lake Michigan with a lot of inland lakes here in West Michigan. The herons, to me, are amazing. And indigo buntings, that gorgeous fluorescent blue color, I have never been able to figure out why Major League Baseball has cardinals and orioles and blue jays. No one has picked up the indigo bunting. I think it would be the perfect, perfect mascot for a baseball team. Are you, are you going to start a ball, ball team, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can afford it, but I'd like to oh. influence someone because indigo bunting, you know, the color of the uniforms would be highly visible from the cheap seats, right? Oh, ouch. Ouch. <laughs> well, you know, maybe the problem is naming your baseball team the Buntings gives away your strategy. You're going to bunt exactly. every time you're at bat. <laughs> I had not thought of that. You hit a home run with that one, Stacy. Well, Bill, it's always fun to talk to you. Uh, I'll tell you what, you're going to be, tre- after this show, you're going to be trending on uh, Twitter or Twitter uh, in the next few days. Uh, but he's the bird man, Bill Stovall. He loves nature. He loves birds. And he's a friend. And he's a friend of the Gardening Simplified show. Bill, it's been a privilege and uh, fun to have you on the show. Well, it's been great to meet you all and to renew our friendship, Rick. So keep up the good work, you guys. We listen to your show and we love it. It's just fantastic. Thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your expertise. That was really, really interesting. You're always welcome. Talk with you soon, I hope. All right. Thanks, Bill. Take care. It's been a pleasure, Stacy. Happy trellis to you until we weed again. Thanks, Rick. Have a great week, everyone.